now we can get into the fun stuff. Um, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, uh, this morning we have sang some songs about how things are going to change when you're going to come back. Lord, I really believe that we are living in the time of the end. I really believe, Father, that this world is in a place of desperation. People are running to and fro, looking for answers. People are hurting. People are hurting themselves. People are hurting others. And Father, you have given this world one solution and one solution alone that most people have rejected. And that's salvation in Jesus Christ. And we here at Really Living have decided to share these messages because we believe that it can help people to embrace the salvation of Jesus Christ and embrace the truth that is in this Bible that most people have in their homes. And we have opened up this Bible over the last 13 weeks and, and un discovered so many new hopeful messages and truths because you are a God of love and you're also a God of justice warning this world of the deceptions that are before us. Today is no different. I ask that you will be with me as I share this difficult message about the truth about hell. In your name I pray, amen. The true story is told of a young man by the name of Robert whose father was a Protestant preacher. And being a preacher's son, for those of you who know about that, he often found himself in a position of hardship. Ever since Robert was a little boy, his father had a bad habit of harshly reprimanding him every time he committed a sin or he did something wrong. It would go something like this. If you keep doing these things, someday the Almighty God is going to get a hold of you, boy. And when he does, he's going to put you in hell fire where you will roast and toast and scream in pain for years and years and years. You should reconsider sinning. Little Robert would stand there as his father would say these things, almost shaking and trembling in his boots, afraid of God. And the thought of his impending doom. Robert grew up and got into some worse sins. Got with the wrong crowds. And he caused more grief to his father by committing more grown-up sins. That he even put the family to shame. And eventually his father lost it on him and said, Robert, what is wrong with you? I have raised you in your whole life to love God and to be a Christian and to keep on refusing. You keep refusing on obeying me and you keep on sinning and doing worse and worse sins. Don't you realize that if you keep living that kind of life, God only has hell for you where you're going to burn and be in pain and not be consumed but suffer and scream and at the rate you're going you are multiplying the decades of your burning because of your sins and Robert had had enough he was older now and he couldn't keep quiet anymore and he looked at his dad right in his eyes and he looked at him and he says I want nothing to do with your God I am sick and tired of hearing about him. I don't believe in a God that would take a person and burn them without consumption for years and years and years. What kind of a loving God is that? I don't want to have anything to do with that God. And he walked out of his father's life and never, ever came back. You know, the father had misjudged that young man. He may have been a sinner, but he was, had a very keen mind and had a sharp intellect. 
He went on to finish high school, then university, and became highly educated and became one of the top lawyers in Chicago. But it wasn't long before that young man became known around the world for more than his legal training, but rather for his staunch atheism. His name was Robert Ingersoll. He became one of the most world-renowned atheists of the 1900s. He devoted his life to hating God and hating the Bible, all because of this one subject that was shoved down his throat when he was young, hellfire. There is so much misunderstanding about this subject, and once again, I don't blame people for misunderstanding. I don't even blame Christians for this misunderstanding. But I do blame us for not looking at history and not studying the Word of God verse by verse to understand how this whole eternal burning torment for ceaseless ages comes from. But in as much as its source is from the Bible, it was a man in the 5th century who misinterpreted the Bible and led to concepts such as purgatory and eternal torment. But Augustine, who at the time was the Bishop of Hippo in North Africa, changed everything. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but I'm going to put this, this link up on the screen. Um, I found this site uh, very commendable, which was a lot of bit of weird at first because it says medium.com. I'm thinking, oh my goodness, this is some kind of do 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 do. Uh, but no, I actually spent a little bit of time reading this, and I wish I could have spent more. But I'm going to state a few things from this website that I found really astute and I think are absolutely true. And I quote: It says here, the doctrine of eternal torment was not a widely held view for the first five centuries after Christ. Particularly in the early Eastern church, the church of the early apostles and church fathers such as Paul, Clement of Alexandria, St. Gregory of Nyssa, Origen, and others. What we do see during this time is the expansion and proliferation of pagan myths about the afterlife, which were then repackaged as eternal, fiery torment about uh, in the Western Catholic Church, primarily by Latin theologians and church leaders from Rome. It seems that this was most likely motivated by political expediency. The idea of eternal torment was a prime tool for controlling the average churchgoer with fear. It was congruent with secular mythologies of that time. Later, pop culture added fuel to the fire, pun intended, through imaginative works like, some of you may have read it, Dante's Inferno. I quote again, due to the history of the biblical text and the numerous influences on its popular translations, we've been left with a very Plato-esque focus on this concept called eternity. I read on. But that was not the paradigm of the Orthodox Church until St. Augustine, a student of Plato, funneled Christian doctrine to Plato's teachings of the eternal soul. This goes back to what we talked about last week. Plato made several philosophical, sorry, Plato made several fi philosophical arguments that have ironically come to define our mainstream Christian paradigms. You hear what I just said? Our mainstream Christian paradigms are funded on philosophy, not on the Bible. First, 
Plato believed that the soul was separate from the body. Remember what we talked about last week? A soul is composed of God's breath and body. But here Plato was teaching that they are separate. And that the soul was fundamentally pure, but tends to become deformed once it's associated with the body. Number two, like his teacher Socrates, Plato believed that the soul itself was immortal. Interesting. Thus, necessitating, oh boy, I'm really struggling with some of my English here, necessitating an eternal destination for the soul after the body dies. If the soul is immortal, immortal, it has to go somewhere after death. And number three, Plato proposed that good actions is a reward in this life. But more importantly, a greater reward after death. Similarly, bad actions result in consequences in this life, but even greater punishment after death. Plato linked some of his ideas to prevailing Greek mythology, including the location of Hades and Tartarus. In Greek mythology, Tartarus is a location deep below Hades where the titans were enslaved and the wicked were tormented. This is from Greek mythology. According to Plato, this is where divine punishment was meted out. It is of this philosophy that St. Augustine remarked the following, and I quote, The utterance of Plato is the most pure and bright in all philosophy, and it is now scattering the clouds of error. Little did he know that actually Plato's philosophy was creating clouds of error. And St. Augustine became one of the most influential church fathers in the 500s A.D. These ideas proposed by Plato are not from the Bible. They are Greek philosophy, but we have spent centuries reading them into the biblical text and even translating the biblical text through the lenses of philosophy. But if we go back before the time of Augustine, we find five centuries of church fathers who never carried that lens. I quote one more, and I'm sorry for taking this time, but I think it's important. And you can go on the website and read a lot more. Dr. Ken Vincent, retired psychology professor from Houston Community College and an author of over 100 books in the fields of psychology and religion, notes this. The first person to write about eternal hell was Latin, West, North African, Tertullian. Some of you may know of him who is considered the father of the Latin church. As most people reason, hell is a place for people you don't like. And interestingly enough, Tertullian fantasized that not only the wicked would be in hell, but also every philosopher and every theologian who didn't agree with him. He envisioned a time when he would look down from heaven at all those people in hell and laugh in glee because he was right. Out of the six theological schools in Tertullian's day and beyond, that is 170 to 430 A.D., the only school that taught the doctrine of eternal torment or hell to its students was the Latin Roman Catholic school in Carthage, Africa. Four of the other five taught that through the death and resurrection of Christ, all people will be saved through restorative judgment and reconciliation in the plan of ages, which we're going to talk about today and next week. By far, this is what Dr. Vincent says, the main person responsible for making hell eternal in the Western church was St. Augustine. He was made Bishop of Hippo in North Africa. He did not know Greek. He tried to study it, but he stopped because he hated it. Sadly, it is his misunderstanding of Greek that cemented the concept of eternal hell in the Western church. 
Augustine not only said that hell was eternal for the wicked, but also for anyone who wasn't a Christian. So complete was this concept of God's exclusion of non-Christians that he considered unbaptized babies as damned. When these babies died, Augustine softened slightly to declare that they would be sent to the upper level of hell, which became known as purgatory. You can read about this in thousands of history books. This is not news. That philosophy creeped in. Just like paganism creeped in to bring in Sunday worship and worshiping Easter, worshiping Christmas, and all those different things, philosophy creeped in to bring in the concept of hell from Greek mythology. So, if the concept of torment and eternal burning is not true, then why does the Bible use words like forever, gnashing of teeth, eternal punishing, punishment, and the gnash? Why does the Bible use some of these words? If one takes the Bible at face value, it is almost inevitable not to see hellfire as a retributive act from God. If you look at it at face value. But as surprising as this will sound to you this morning, listen carefully. Hellfire is an act of love from God. Doesn't the concept of an everlasting, burning, torturous hell sound wrong? in the light of what we have been learning about God over the last 13 weeks? I mean, if we were just to think logically speaking, follow me on this. Satan and God are a team if you believe in hell that is somewhere in the center of the earth. Because Satan is in charge of hell and God provides the fuel by sending people down there. So they're working together. That just doesn't make, that, 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 that logically just doesn't, that doesn't show me the kind of love that we've been looking at. So I will, I'm hoping today that you can discover, we can discover together the love of God even in hellfire. So let's start with questions and let's get some biblical reasoning in the subject. Uh, the three questions that will come up is when uh, will hell burn and where is hell and how long will it burn for? I, I think if we can cover those three questions all based on Bible verses and I think we can then tackle some more difficult verses. So let's start with uh, at the beginning uh, the word hell itself. Right, so the word hell is found 54 times in the Bible, and 42 times it is displayed as these two. Shoal in the Old Testament, and Hades in the New Testament. There's another one that we're going to talk in a couple of minutes, but those are 42 times those words are used. Uh, when it says hell in your Bible, it's one of those two in the original text. Now, interestingly enough, they are translated as hell in the Bible, but did you know that they actually mean grave these two words actually mean the grave 42 times out of 54 that hell is used in the bible it simply means the grave let me let me just uh, put some verses on the screen that will help you to understand this and i actually read all 42 of those verses uh this week and uh, i have to admit that some of them you have to do a little digging to see it as grave. Because we often think, you know, whenever it talks about down there, talking about Hades down there, we think of some place center in the earth or wherever uh, it is. But it just means down there as in below the ground. 
here's one for example. It's Psalms chapter 9 verse 17 says, The wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. Turned into hell? I, I thought hell was a place. Right? But turned into hell simply means that they're going to go from living to six feet under. That's one example. Another one is, if I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. This is the psalmist talking. And if I make my bed in hell, be the how, behold, you are there. Do anybody actually believe that God is in hell? Like a burning place in the center of the earth somewhere? No, it's talking about death, the grave. And we know that God has been there because Jesus himself was buried. We just sang a whole bunch of songs about it. But he rose from the dead. So Jesus is acquainted with death. But not hell as we have commonly have said this. Another really interesting one, but you have to go to your Bible to this. This is so interesting. Acts chapter 2. And I get excited about some of these things. Go to your Bibles to Acts chapter 2, and we'll start at verse 27. And yes, I have to show my age. <sighs> I, I'm going to start at verse 20. We'll start at verse 25. It says, For David said concerning him, For I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope. For those of you who don't know, David is a man who lived many, many, many years before these verses uh, were written here in, in the New Testament. But this is a quote from one of his, one of his psalms that David wrote. And, and he says here, For you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of joy in your presence. Folks, this is... David writing prophetic words about Jesus. Follow me. Verse 27, men and brethren, this is now um, Peter speaking. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet, verse 30, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne, he, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. Folks, did Jesus go to hell? No, he went to Hades. He went to the grave. And there are, like I said, 40, 39 more verses like this. If you want to have some fun, spend some time looking at some of these verses. We have to be careful because 42 out of 54 times the word hell in the Bible means the grave and not some burning place in the middle of the earth. But on 12 occasions, there is a word that is used for hell. It's Gehenna. And it's used 12 times, and it means a place of burning. And those verses have also led many to be confused about hell. And we're going to talk about some of them a little later. But before I go on, I have to let you know that there's going to be two burnings. And this is an interesting, something I've discovered as I was preparing for this sermon. Um, one of them will annihilate the wicked at the second coming of Jesus. The Bible talks about fire coming down when he comes and people will be killed at his presence. And then the other one will be after the thousand years. That one has for purpose to purify the earth of sin which includes the wicked, Satan, and all of his minions. And it can be very confusing when we open up the Bible to read some of those verses. I'm hoping, I'm really hoping that I can make that clear for you today. I will do my best. So question one, when? When is hell 
going to be. So let's go to Matthew, and uh, I'm going to ask you to open up your Bibles and go to Matthew, Matthew chapter 13. So for those of you who are new, Matthew is right at the beginning of the New Testament, uh, one of Jesus' disciples, Matthew chapter 13, and we'll go to verses 24 to 30. Matthew chapter 13, verses 24 to to 30. It says, another parable he put forth to them, saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while man slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came to him and said, sir, did you, did you not sow Seeds in the field, then why do we have tares? Tares is just another way, another word for weeds. He said to them, an enemy has done this. The servant said to him, do you want us then to go and gather them up? Do you want us to go and pull up the weeds? But he says, no. Lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest and at the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barns. Okay, just in case you think that I'm interpreting anything wrong, let's go to, to verse 36. Verse 36 of the same chapter in Matthew, just a little bit down the road here. And then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house. And his disciples came to him saying, Please, can you please explain to us the parable of the tares in the field? So Jesus does. He says in verse 37, He answered and said to them, He who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. Or another word for Jesus. Another terminology for Jesus. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom. But the tares are the sons of the wicked one. That would be none other than Satan. The enemy who sowed them is a devil. The harvest is the end of the age. Very important. And the reapers are the angels. Therefore, verse 40, as the tares are gathered and burnt in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. The Son of Man will send out His angels. They will gather out of His kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness. And He will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Let me ask you a very simple question, Melissa. When does the burning happen according to this parable? At the end of the age. Which means there's no one burning now. The Bible does not contradict itself. Last week we learned that whether wicked or righteous, except for a few righteous people, everyone is sleeping until the end of the world. We were clear on that. This verse goes in perfect harmony with this and even continues. If you go to verse 49, it even goes even forward. It says, so it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth, separate the wicked from the just, and cast them into the fiery furnace. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. At the end of the age. There's another verse in 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. This is near the end of your Bible. And today I'm warning you, we're going to read a lot of Bible verses. And so get yourself ready. 2 Peter is near the end of your Bible. You have first and second Peter. Peter was also one of the disciples of Jesus, one of the most vocal ones. But when it comes to writing, he wrote very little. Uh, but what he wrote was incredibly profound. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, it says, Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust, the unjust under punishment for, what? The day of 
judgment. That's one day, the day of judgment. Another terminology for the second coming of Jesus. Based on these two verses alone, can you tell me how many people are bar burning in hellfire today? Yeah, zero. But we're not done. We're not done. Let's go to Revelation chapter 20. I told you that this would be a study on the book of Revelation. And uh, yes, we did. It took a little bit of a detour to talk about certain things. But we're gonna, this week and next week and the following week, we're going to be digging into some things that you are going to be totally amazed. If you go to Revelation 20 and we start at verse 11 all the way to verse 15. Very interesting what it says here. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was no place found for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, the death in Hades developed the death who were in it, and they, they were judged each according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is a second death, and anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. This is speaking of a burning. Not one at the second coming of Jesus. Here is how the lake of fire burns at the end of the world. Let's take a look at the sequence of events of this time of the end. We will look in, we're going to look into this into more details. But I just want you to follow with this slide here. Um, this, is, th this is what we're going to cover over the next this week and next week. So I don't fully expect you to understand everything we're going to talk about today, but just hold on to it till next week. But this is a sequence of event. Second coming, day of judgment, the, the, the last trumpet, whatever terminology you want to use, right there, the second coming of Jesus. We talked about this several weeks ago, that those who believe in Jesus Christ and accepted his salvation, they will be raptured, which means what? They will be taken up, right? At that time, at the second coming of Jesus. And then we have what's called the first resurrection. So not just those who are alive, but those who also died in Jesus will be raptured and taken up. Then we have, we have the first death of the wicked who are slain by the glory of the Lord. Let's just say for explanation's sake that Jesus was to come back tonight. This is the order of events that would happen. All the events on the left part of your screen would take place. Then we would go through a period of a thousand years that we're going to talk about next week. And then once a thousand years are over, all the things on the right are going to happen. And I am not going to confuse you for those at this time. How does this fire start? I, I'm just tickling you a little bit with this stuff. We'll get into it more next week. Let's go to verse 9 in Revelation 20. Verse 9 in Revelation 20. It says, Then they went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. That's hell. Right there. Satan's last act of defiance will be to gather all the wicked that have resurrected at the second resurrection, and he will try to take over the city full of God's people who are coming down after 1,000 year vacation. And during that attempt, fire will come down from heaven and consume them all. Hell is not down below. According to this, it actually comes from heaven. Ask any preacher where hell is. Most preachers will tell you that it's somewhere in the center of the earth. But that's just not in the Bible. It's not anywhere in the Bible. 
there's a lot of verses on hell, especially in the Old Testament that talk about hell as below, but that's just because it's talking about the grave. And in most cases, graves are below. So now that we know when it's going to happen, at the second coming of Jesus initially and then after the thousand years, let's answer the question as to where. And I think we've already kind of covered that a little bit. We, we, we already had an indication it's going to be all over this earth, and that's exactly what the Bible teaches. Go back to Second Peter, but go to chapter 3. Second Peter and chapter 3. Very interesting verses. We start at verse 7. And we'll do verse 7. Oh, you have it on the screen. And we'll do uh, verses 10 to 13 as well. Verse 7 says, But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. So now we have the when and the where. What does this verse say is going to be consumed? Two things. What? The heaven and the earth. And if you go to verse 10, it says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burnt up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what matter of person are you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of the Lord, because of which the heaven will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat? Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness will dwell. See, I like this verse because it doesn't say, oh, you know that fire is coming, so you should be trembling and being good. No, you should be telling other people about it so that they too will be saved. But it specifically says this over and over. Everything on the earth will be melted as well as everything in heaven. We have now taken sin to the atmosphere. We have satellites that throw all kinds of trash on our television sets. If it wasn't for these satellites, we wouldn't be able to see some of the trash that we see. We even have a space station now that is being built. It was started, I believe, in 1988 with pieces from different parts of the world to extend our territory beyond this earth that we are destroying. We need to find another place to live, so we're going to create one up there. Now, that place can only host about 20 people, so they better hurry up to make it bigger because I don't think I'll be part of the elect for that one. All sin will be removed, both in heaven and on earth. Because it says in Revelation 21 verse 1, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth has passed away. God knows the extent of our sin. There's stuff floating in the, up there. The things that were destroyed that just keep going around the earth and around the earth. It's sin. You see, this is why I think that hellfire is good news. Because all sin, all sinners who love sin will be removed. Only to be replaced with a sinless heaven and a sinless earth. And he's going to restore everything to how it was at the beginning. See, you can't bury sin. Someone could dig it up. You also can't throw sin into the deepest ocean because eventually it's going to wash up on some shore. But when you burn something, it gets consumed and it is impossible to identify it or to put it back together. You see, this is why God chose the medium of fire. Not to hurt people and to cause pain to people, but to annihilate sin once and for all. So now that we know where it's going to burn, and we know when, and we need to tackle the last one. 
How long? That's the tough one. That's the one that has pushed so many people away from God. A God that vindictively tortures and watches people scream in pain for eternity. Let me start with a statement. That even though the Bible doesn't tell us exactly how long hellfire is going to burn, it will not burn through the ceaseless ages of eternity. And I'll do my best to prove this with the Bible in the coming minutes. And you may have some of your own Bible verses as well. We'll cover them all. But first I want to give you three logical reasons. And I know that that can get a little edgy. Three logical reasons as to why hellfire cannot burn through the ceaseless ages of eternity. And then we'll look at the Bible to support my claims. Number one, we've already learned that hellfire is going to burn all over the earth and consume everything. And we also learned that on top of these ashes and melted elements, God will create a new heaven and a new earth. If hellfire burns forever, then God can't create a new heaven and a new earth. That's number one. And number two, God is just and fair and a God of love, as we've learned over the last 13 weeks. Let's say I'm going to go back 6,000 years to Cain. We talked about Cain and Abel. That was the first murder. Those were Adam and Eve's two sons, and Cain killed his brother Abel. Let's say that Cain killed his brother at the altar and let's say that he goes to hell wherever that is and let's say that Cain has been roasting and toasting however that's possible and has been tormented in a fire for the last 6,000 years. Then we come to 1940 where Hitler is responsible for millions of Jews dying. And let's say he dies and goes to hell wherever that is and roasts and toasts however that's possible and there he is along with Cain. Which one do you think deserves to suffer more? Would God be fair and would God be just to burn Cain for 6,000 years and Hitler for just however long he's been there since 1940, supposedly? Let's say you have an 80-year-old man who sinned his whole life and never accepted Jesus as a Savior. Let's say he dies and goes to hell and for 70 or 80 years of sin, you tell me that he's going to burn for the ceaseless ages of eternity? How does that make any sense? If God is like that, then Hitler is a saint. We serve a God of love where the Bible says he doesn't want anyone to perish, but for all to come to everlasting life. If he doesn't want people to perish, he definitely doesn't want people to suffer. If he's a God of love. But if he's a retributive God, then yes, let me not kill them. Let me get them to roast and suffer for all the bad things they've done. If that's the image of God you have, which is a hope, I hope is not the one that I've painted for you over the last 13 weeks. I believe that the verses that we've looked at so far do away with the common belief of hell. And the fact that he doesn't want anyone to perish, but all to come to everlasting life. God is a creator. He's not a destroyer. Thirdly, last logical reason, last week we studied that when people die, only those who are saved will be given immortality. Right? You remember that? We know that right now, only God has immortality. But that at the second coming of Jesus, he says we will be clothed with incorruptibility and immortality at the second coming of Jesus. If somebody burns forever, they're also immortal. And the Bible says that only God's saints will be immortal. The only way you can burn forever is if you live forever. So, Okay, those were my three logical reasonings. Do with it as you wish. Let's see if the Bible supports what I just said. First and foremost, we have to go to 
Romans chapter 6, um, verse 23. I think that's the next slide. Sorry, I had a nice little slide here with my three points, but I forgot uh, timing, love, and immortal soul. And um, so Romans chapter 6, verse 23. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. You can go there. It's in the New Testament. You're going to find it right after the book of Acts, I believe. Um, and it says this. It says, for the wages of sin is punishment, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ. Right? Is that what your Bible says? No. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is our first clue. The consequences of sin is not suffering and torture, but death. It would have said eternal suffering versus eternal life. It just says death if you if, if you die in your sin without being forgiven versus if you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you have eternal life. One is eternal. The other one is eternal only in its consequence, but not in its action. I mean, perhaps uh, we studied that earlier, but I'll skip that. I mean, one of the most famous verses in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever will believe in him shall not suffer in torture for years to come, but have everlasting life. Again, the contrast is there. Perish versus everlasting life. It's not everlasting suffering versus everlasting life. It's perish contrasted with everlasting life. There are only two options. Psalms 37 verse 9 to 10 has something very interesting. Go to that for me, if you will. And this is in the Old Testament. Psalms chapter 37, verses 9 to 11. It says, For evildoers shall be what? Cut off. But those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall be no more. Indeed, you will look carefully for his place, but it shall be no more. But the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. One lives forever, the other one is cut off. Again, the two sides. And what's going to happen to them if you go to verse 20? But the wicked shall perish and the enemies of the Lord like the splinter of the meadows shall vanish into smoke they shall vanish away they will vanish into smoke just like in Psalm 62 if you just go up a few more few pages from where you are sorry Psalm 68 verse 2 it talks about this smoke it says as smoke is driven away so drive them away as wax melts before the fire so let the wicked perish at the presence of God do we see anything in these verses that talk about them burning forever and ever and ever and suffering and being tortured and, and crying and weeping and please get me out of here and no it talks about an end not a torture they shall perish and not over a long period of time but at the presence of God it says here so let the wicked perish at the presence of God when God shows up they die Let's go back to Revelation chapter 20. i like to put all this together for you now. In verse 9. Revelation 20 verse 9. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in a beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. In verse 14 it says, Then Hades, death and Hades 
Some people say, well, that's the same thing. Well, no. Some people have died and don't have a grave. There are millions of people who died without a grave. Soldiers and wars and, you know, bodies have rotted. And, I mean, th- th- this, is, this is death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. And this is the second death. The wicked do not spend eternity in hell. Hellfire brings about their second death. Why is it called the second death? Well, that's pretty simple because the first death took place when? At the second coming of Jesus. Because at that point, they are slain by the glory of God and by the breath of His mouth. We read that earlier. That's the first death of the wicked. Or if they passed away while alive on earth here, not accepting Jesus Christ as their personal Savior and embracing His love in their lives. But this one that we talk about here in Revelation 20, that's the second death. Because they are now burnt with the hellfire that comes down from heaven and sin is gone. This fire will have a purifying effect, removing sin and anybody who loves sin more than God. It says in Revelation 21, verse 8, But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexual immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in a lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. That is terminal. That is purifying. It's all over. Once this has taken place and the earth is purified by fire and the wicked are destroyed, God is going to redo it all over again. Read with me. Revelation 21 verse 1. It says, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away then he who sat on the throne said behold i make all things new and he said to me right for these words are true and faithful john write this because it's going to happen exactly as i said do you begin to see the plan of god do you begin to see the loving plan of God this place is full of sickness greed hatred and loveless and God is going to make everything brand new again sin will be no more no more temptation no more sickness no more mortgage no more death no more police stations no more lawyers no more doctors Come on, let's be honest. And as much as we try to make this world a happy place and there are happy moments, this is not a happy place. It's just not. And I'm not trying to be negative or defeatist here. As a Christian, I do the best I can to show the love of God. And and people who are not Christian do the same. They love, we do the best we can. But come on, it's not a happy place. Let's just be honest. And, and, and as Christians, we haven't written off this world and just said, forget all this. I'm just waiting to be beamed up and in a new place. No, we do the best we can to, with the love of God in our hearts to make this place a happy place. It is our duty 
to, to, to keep the law of God, to show His love in our life, and to, to be an influence, to be ambassadors, to be lights in this world. And there are many people who do this, Christian or not. But let's face it. It needs to be made new without sin. We are fighting sin all the time in our own personal lives and in this world. I want to be there. I want to be in the presence of God for eternity. Praising His name. Worshipping Him and learning about all the things that I just can't learn about right now. Okay. Yesterday, I went golfing. I wish I could go more, but I got to go yesterday. And it was interesting because... As I got there, I got there late. And I saw there was a threesome that I was supposed to play with. That's three people. And there was another threesome that was behind them. And the, the, the gentleman at the front told me, I'm going to put you with this threesome because you're a little late with these guys. I said, no, I want to be with them. I don't know why I said that, but I said it. And so he says, okay, I'm going to drive up and tell them to wait so you can drive your ball and you can join them. I said, okay, great. And I had the killer drive, man. It was so nice. And then after that, it took me forward to get to the green. So it was, it was horrible. But uh, uh, it, it was my pride, right? I did a nice drive. Everybody was watching it. Oh, yeah, look at that. And then pff, I just, God knows how to teach us lessons. I get there, and it's a father with his two sons. And some of the nicest people I've ever met. I love golfing for that reason because I don't get to golf with friends. There's not too many people that I know here who like to golf or have the time or the money to do it. And so I, I, I'm able to, to do that sometimes. I get golf, you know, 15, maybe 20 times a year if I'm lucky. Um, and um, we started to befriend each other and talk. And the father, the sons had a cart and the father was walking. I was walking too. And as we're going down... Um, at one point, he tells me that one of his sons wants to be a missionary. I said, oh, I, I, I was a missionary too. I, I've gone to some parts of the world. And he goes, oh, yeah. I said, yeah. I says, I'm a pastor. Oh, really? He says, yeah. So we started talking. And then he says, I'm a Baptist. And I go to Westland, West Highland Baptist. I said, oh, nice. And he, just the nicest people. Then he, then, he, then he wrestles me to the ground almost, not physically. But he says, oh, so you guys must, let me ask you a question. How often does your church talk about grace? Because he knew I was a Seventh-day Adventist. And for some reason, for some reason, I don't know why, but some people think that Seventh-day Adventists only believe in the law and not in grace, which is absolutely not true, as you've heard from some of the sermons that I've preached. So I, I, I was like, whoa, why, where is he going with this? And so then I had a little fun with him because he liked to banter around. So I said, what do you think about hell? And this is further down, probably in hole number 17 or something like that. It was near the end. And he goes, oh, well, it's pretty simple. And he quotes to me the next three verses that we're going to talk about. All three, in the same order that I'm going to present them to you today. And he says, it's pretty obvious from the Bible that hell is in the center of the earth and that it's going to last forever. I'm like, whoa, really? And then he gives me the verses that we're about to talk about. So let's tackle some of these verses together. And uh, I'm going to close with this because they are confusing verses. I agree. And we've just read more than 20 verses now that are crystal clear. Crystal clear. And we're going to tackle some that, in my opinion, almost say the opposite of what we just learned. But the Bible doesn't contradict itself. It's a safe rule here. When we deal with the Bible, you always need to make sure you read all the texts. So let's go back to Revelation 20. There is a clear contradiction here if we just look at this at face value. Revelation 20, verses 9 and 10. We read those, but I'm going to read them again. Revelation 20. I got I to gotta put these on. It's having a heart. Then they went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Right? We're, we've read that. Now let's read verse 10. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beasts and the prophets are. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. 
Come on. Let's... Devoured them and day and night forever and ever. Well, when I devour something like a hamburger or a hot dog or something, when I devour it, it disappears in seconds. I don't eat one bite day and night forever and ever. You know, well, Tina's probably laughing as she's listening to this right now because when I do buy a chocolate bar, it usually lasts anywhere between two to three months uh, because I eat one bite and I leave it there and then I tell her not to touch it and she hates that because she wants to be able to touch it too. But I know how much I have left and I manage it within the two months of my life, right? So if she eats it, it mixes everything up. But when it comes to... Uh, certain things, I do not eat at it like a chipmunk. I just devour it, right? And so the only, this is the only verse in the Bible that uses the word forever in the context and the subject of hellfire. And it's pretty simple. All we have to do is compare Scripture with Scripture again. The question is, does the word forever in the Bible mean the ceaseless ages of eternity? That's the question. And the answer is no. Forever is a relative word. Relative in the context in which you read it. For example, I'd say to my wife, babe, I love you and I'm going to love you forever. Is that true? In the context of what we want to understand. No, it's not true. Because once I die, I can't love her anymore. Therefore, the word forever only lasts as long as I last. So forever here needs to be seen in a context in which it is spoken. We'll look at a few texts here, but the word forever in your Bible is used in the context of things which have already ended 56 times. It doesn't mean for ceaseless ages of time. And I'll show you just a few examples on the screen this morning. Don't go to these verses because we're running out of time. But I'll show them to you. It says, Hannah did not go up for she said to her husband, Not until the child is weaned then I will take him that he may appear before the Lord and remain there forever. So this is a story in the Bible of little Samuel whose mother Hannah was not able to have a child until God, she promised God that if she has a child, she will allow him to serve God and she will, he, he will not be in her home. He will be serving in the temple. And this is exactly what happened. And he was going to remain there forever. And if you look at verse 28, Therefore I also have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he shall be lent to the Lord. So you see the word forever means as long as he lives. So they worship the Lord there. Is Samuel still in the temple today? No. He's been dead for a long time. So does forever mean the ceaseless ages of eternity? Yes or no? And Jonah. Jonah is a story of a man who was a prophet. And... Um, was asked by God to go speak to certain people. He didn't want to, so he went the opposite direction, and he ended up in the belly of a whale. I know, it sounds like a funny story, but it's actually true. And then he's in there, and he says, Now the Lord had appeared a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. And then this is Jonah's reaction, recollection of the story. In chapter 2, verse 6, he says, I went down to the moorings of the mountains. The earth with its bars closed behind me forever. Yet you have brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. How long was forever for Jonah? Three days and three nights. In this context, forever was a very short period. But it felt like forever. Like some of the children listening to this sermon right now. <laughs> it's the same thing in Revelation. Forever means till all is consumed. As a matter of fact, the Greek word for forever is very interesting. It is aeon, which means age. Sometimes we hear from age to age. Age doesn't last. It lasts its age. It lasts its length. 
We have the Bronze Age, the Iron Age. We have the, maybe we should have the Titanium Age. I don't know. Different ages through time. They didn't last. They depict a certain amount of time. So we have maybe misunderstood what the word forever means in the Bible. I like Isaiah 47 verse 14. It says this. Just listen. Behold, they shall be as stubble. Stubble is dry, dry little pieces of wood or, or pieces of, 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 of bush that if you put a match into this thing, it will just whoo, go. But they shall be as stubble. The fire shall burn them. They shall not deliver themselves from the power of the flame. It shall... It shall not be a coal to be warmed by, nor a fire to sit before. Once God consumes the wicked, there is no fire, not even a piece of coal for them to warm their feet on. That's clear. It will start like a wildfire, but it will end with nothing to warm your feet on. The next one is a perplexing text, I have to admit. It's in Mark chapter 9. This is a second text that my friend presented to me. I found this so ironic that he would present these exact same texts I'm sharing with you today. Because there aren't that many folks, by the way. Right? It's in Mark chapter 9, verse 43 and 44. I have it on the screen. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Right there... Right there, just that verse alone <laughs> make you think that maybe God is trying to make a point, but not a physical one, more of a, a spiritual one, right? Because if that was the case, then I'd be talking to you with <laughs> no hands, okay? So if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life maimed. That doesn't make sense either. Because the Bible tells us that when we go to heaven, there'll be no sin, no sorrow, no pain. We will be incorruptible. We, so there's no way that anybody's getting into heaven without hands. Okay. All right, so it is better for you to enter into life maim rather than having two hands to go to hell into the fire that shall never be quenched. Where the, the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Wow. That is a really difficult one to deal with. This is where we go back to Gehenna, the, 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 the 12 verses, because the word hell here is not Hades, it's, it's Gehenna that is being used. Now, if you look at any Bible dictionary, this is how they define Gehenna. Very interesting. I found one in Mount's Greek Dictionary, one that I own. It says Gehenna, pronoun, is the valley of Hinnom, South of Jerusalem, once celebrated for the horrid worship and human sacrifices by fire offered to Moloch, and afterwards polluted with every species of filth, as well as the carcasses of animals and dead bodies of malefactors, to consume which, in order to avert the pestilence which such a mass of corruption would occasion, constant fires were kept burning." As Jesus often walked by there, which essentially was the city dump, he would point to it as an example of hell. Hence, when it says, fire that never shall be quenched, there seems to be fires in that dump all the time. Therefore, this must mean for the ceaseless ages of eternity. However, let's use the Bible again. It either means for ceaseless ages of eternity, or let me suggest that when it talks about a fire that is unquenchable, it means it can't be put out. Nineteen times in your Bible, unquenchable fire is mentioned. Every single one of them is crystal, crystal clear. See, that's the problem. I need to drink. Because my words are not crystal clear. 
I, I, those are the two words I have the hardest time to put together because my mouth is dry. Let's go to Isaiah 34. Isaiah 34. <clears throat> and I have it on the screen too, so you don't have to go there if you don't want to. Maybe you like your own version, and that's fine. Uh, Isaiah 34. Actually, I don't think I have the whole thing up there, so let me go there too. That's in the Old Testament. <clears throat> it's a big book. Big book, pretty much in the middle of your Bible, if you're uh, kind of looking for it. Isaiah chapter 34. He's one of the prophets. Isaiah was one of the prophets that God called out to go, and he didn't end up in the belly of a fish because he did what God asked him to do. So you go to verse 8. It says, For in the day of the Lord's vengeance, the year of recompense for the cause of Zion, its streams shall be turned into pitch, and its dust into brimstone, its land shall become burning pitch. It shall not be quenched night or day. Its smoke shall ascend forever. From generation to generation it shall lie waste. No one shall pass through it forever and ever. This is talking about the judgment on the land of Edom. Which were a people who, the, the whole chapter, Isaiah 34, you can read it. It's talking about a judgment of God on Edom who were people who mistreated Israel. Now let me ask you a question. Is Edom burning today? No, it's not burning today. But God said that the fire would be not be quenched. What does it mean? I believe it means an act of God. And no matter how man may try, they will not be able to quench the fire until it has consumed what God instilled for it to consume. And all of the 19 scriptures are like this. Let's look at another one. Jeremiah 17. I have it on the screen. Another one of God's prophets. He says, But if you will not heed me to hallow the Sabbath day, such as not carrying a burden when entering the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, then I will kindle a fire in its gates, and it shall devour the place of Jerusalem, and it shall not be quenched. Folks, this happened. When Babylon came in and took over, Jeremiah was the prophet who warned Israel of Babylon as going to come. He did it for, for many years. And yet it happened and Jerusalem was burnt. Is Jerusalem burning today? It is not. But what God meant is when I put this place into fire, nobody's going to be able to put it out. Because I made the decision. I know what's best as God's. And there's more. There's another one in Ezekiel. And say to the force of the south, Hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will kindle fire in thee, and it shall devour every green tree in thee, and every dry tree. The flaming flame shall not be quenched, and all faces from the south to the north shall be burnt therein, and all flesh shall see that I, the Lord, have kindled it. It shall not be quenched. Folks, when God rains fire on the earth on Judgment Day, there aren't enough fire trucks in the world to put it out. Because it's a judgment of God and no one can stop God's judgments. And once the fire has done its work, it will go out on its own. Do you see how the Bible interprets itself? Don't believe in what you hear, but believe in the well-constructed Word of God. There is philosophy in the Bible, but it's God's philosophy, not human philosophy. All right, let's go to the final one because I'm already, boy, I'm... Uh. Then Matthew 25, verse 41. This is another one that this gentleman quoted to me. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. I liked that this verse actually shows that God has plans to burn, but it's, the plan was to burn the devil and his angels. The problem is sometimes I wonder why some people are so hell-bent on going to hell when salvation is right there. So unfortunately, anybody else who continues to embrace sin will be consumed along with that. And it says, and these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. This is pretty simple. It doesn't say everlasting punishing. 
It says everlasting punishment. You see, the effect of the fire is everlasting, not the action of it. The big difference. It doesn't mean for the ceaseless ages of eternity except for the effect of that fire. I mean, look at it. If you go to Jude chapter 7, Jude chapter 7, it's a tiny little book at the end of your Bible. It says, Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Is Sodom and Gomorrah, are they burning today? They are not. As a matter of fact, they're buried under the sea, the Dead Sea. There's no way they can be burning in the middle of a sea. No. This is the exact same kind of fire that we just read in Matthew chapter 25, that the wicked are going to burn in hell with an everlasting fire. They are not burning today. Does that mean eternal? Simply the results are eternal, but the fire obviously goes out. Eternal fire does not mean to the ceaseless ages of eternity. In fact, do you want to see how complete their destruction will be? This next verse is really hot. No pun intended. 2 Peter 2.6 And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly. And Luke even takes it further. He says, but the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Sodom is not burning today. When God comes and throws his fires down, it will devour, it will consume, and it will be the end. And I can tell you something, there will be tears in God's eyes as he does this. God is a creator, not a destroyer. And throughout the history of the Bible, God did destroy. He did. It's evident. It's there. People died. Yet, interestingly enough, I believe God did it so that he would have to kill the least amount of people so that more could be created and live in peace. God tells us here that the time of the end will be like that day, fire coming down from heaven. And we come full circle. The whole Bible doesn't contradict itself, but rather explains itself. But then my friend on the golf course had one last curveball. And so let's read it, because this is the most confusing of them all. Go to your Bibles to Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. We start at verse 19. Luke chapter 16. And we start at verse 19. Jesus is talking to people, to the Pharisees. <clears throat> and he's talking about people who are not using the time that they have on this earth to be useful for God, but rather that they are using this time that they have on this earth for their own benefit. This is a thrust of Luke chapter 16. And this is also the problem in people not reading things into context. Let's go. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate. A poor man was at rich man's gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried 
And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in the water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your life you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus' evil things, but now he is comforted and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fix, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Then he said, I beg you therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers that, have, that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said to him, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. <sighs> wow. This just throws my whole case out to, to hell. <laughs> I mean... It says right there. So I asked my new friend on hole number 17. I said, do you believe that people who are in hell can talk to people who are in heaven? He goes, no, no, no. I said, but that's what happened in the story. So then I asked him, I said, what's the point of this story? You know what he told me? He says, the point of this story is that there's a heaven and a hell. I said, really? That's what you got out of that story? So I pulled out my phone and I read it to him. Because his sons had hit balls in the woods, so they were looking for their balls, so we had some time. And I said, after reading the story, I said, what's the purpose of this story? He goes, oh, I think the reason why Jesus said the story was to help us understand that we need to be aware of God now because once we die, there's absolutely no chance for us. I said, you got it. This is an allegory to help people understand that we need to be ready for Jesus now. Well, we got to hole number 18. And he parted. He was really happy about that. And I told him, I says, as I left, I said, my dear brother, I really enjoyed this game with you. And I hope we don't see each other in hell. <laughs> he laughed. He walked away and he says, I'll take a look, another look at it when I get home. I'd like to close with this statement. Here's what I really think hell is. Here's what I really think God's punishment is. Is to be denied to be in the presence of God. That's the true punishment. That we would live our life here, ignoring him and his goodness. And get to a place at the time of the end when we look back and say, man, I should have listened. Man, I should have, I should have, I should have. And at that time, alive, without grace and mercy, is the extent of hell. Right now, you and I are benefiting from the love of God and the grace of God in spite of the fact that we may not choose Him. That Robert Ingersoll, who, who lived his life destroying Christianity, destroying the Bible, he did it under the grace of God. But at one point in life, there will be no grace, there will be no mercy, and we will be those 
who have not accepted the salvation in Jesus Christ will bear the full weight of their decision without any light at the end of the tunnel. That's why in Revelation 20 it says, there was no place found for them. Folks, I will live my life to tell people the truth about the word of God. Because if you live your life thinking that we serve a vindictive God that is currently right now watching people burning while Satan is laboring to make sure that he keeps everything going, well, you have got it all wrong. And how could you ever serve a God like that? I can't. I can't. Next week, we're going to tackle a very interesting subject. The title is going to be uh, The Ultimate End of Sin. And I invite you to join us because we're going to be unraveling some things in the book of Revelation chapter 20 and 21 and 19 that are so eye-opening and yet so clear but have been made so fuzzy over the years. I hope you'll join us, Father in heaven. Man, I am so glad that I was able to share this message today. And I really believe in my heart in a humble way that this is true. I really believe that this is what hell is. A separation from God forever. And the end of anyone who does not want to be with God. If we think about it, Father, if you would allow wicked people to be in heaven with you, where they can't steal, they can't lie, they can't cheat, they can't sleep around, well, then heaven would be hell. And so, Lord, you and your almighty wisdom and your love are preventing those poor people from suffering for eternity by not forcing them to worship you and to serve other people for the rest of for the rest of eternity. And in your act of love, you will be with those who want to serve you and who want to consider other people as better than themselves. So Lord, prepare us now. If we live, if we have eternal life, let us not as Christians think that eternal life begins when Jesus Christ comes again. Eternal life begins now, which means that God is living in us now. And we are displaying his character now. Some of us may not, may not be able to make it to that day. Like our friend, uh, Dr. Case, who is now resting in Jesus. But for some of us, we may be able to make it to that day. Be with us, I pray. And lead us, like you say in the Bible, into the everlasting. In your name I pray. Amen.